Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed your time at Trailhead DX so far. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you today about how we built an individual-centric, multi-tenant marketplace on Heroku. Uh, my name is Nick Bailey. I lead product and innovation for Salesforce.org. Uh, of course, every Salesforce presentation has to start with a forward-looking statement. Uh, please base any purchasing decisions on uh, products and services that are currently available today. So we're going to tell you how we built uh, Philanthropy Cloud, which is uh, the latest cloud from Salesforce.org. But I want to start by telling you a little bit about Salesforce.org and who we are and why I work here. At Salesforce.org, we believe that change makers creating a better world should have the tools to make that possible. And Salesforce.org has been a part of Salesforce's culture since the very first day. Mark Benioff has said that the business of business is improving the state of the world. And that had a tremendous impact on my, on my life personally. For a long time, I thought I didn't want to have anything to do with nonprofits. I wasn't interested in giving my money. I wasn't interested in giving my time. I had really no interest in being uh, in the business of working with nonprofits and education institutions. But I had the opportunity to meet uh, three refugees from South Sudan that had resettled to Chicago. And all they wanted to do was to go back home after a devastating civil war and help their communities rebuild by creating schools. And I got introduced to them and was just absolutely floored and compelled by their personal mission that they were on in life. And I wanted to do whatever I could to help make that possible for them. And that led me to Salesforce initially for uh, fundraising, managing all of the donors that we had at the nonprofit they founded. And it uh, eventually led to custom applications like tracking our brick production operations in South Sudan, uh, where workers would email us a template every day of how many bricks they'd made, how many workers showed up, how many bags of cement did we use, how many bricks did we make, so that we could understand when we had enough bricks to go build another school. And I saw the power of technology to help nonprofits and change makers create the change that they wanted. But I was also extraordinarily lucky in that I happened to fall into a relationship with these three young men who changed the course of my life. And I want everyone to have that opportunity because it's hard to find a cause that you love and that you can get engaged with and take action. So there's three things we do at Salesforce.org. We provide technology discount and donation to uh, nonprofits and educational institutions. We make investments in the future of the workforce by grants to our community. And we enable an army of citizen philanthropists at uh, Salesforce to go out and volunteer. And we've actually volunteered more than 4 million hours in the history of Salesforce with our employee base. And that's something that we've invested in significantly over the 20 years of our history at Salesforce. It's deeply part of our culture, being engaged in our communities and giving back. And we've refined how we've done that. And our customers have come to us and said, how have you built this culture? Can you help us do the same? And because we believe that every change maker should have all the tools they need to be able to create the change they want in the world, uh, we want to help every employee at every company have that same kind of experience. And that's why we created Philanthropy Cloud. It's a single platform for all of a company's employee giving, employee volunteering, grants management, fund disbursement, impact measurement. Every individual in Philanthropy Cloud gets a personalized profile that drives a personalized experience, helps them find ways to get engaged that are personally relevant and meaningful for them, and helps them grow on their journey as a citizen philanthropist. Nonprofits benefit because they get to let employees and companies know what are the things that we need, what are we raising money for, what do we need volunteers for so that they can be successful uh, in their missions. And of course, companies get insight into the ways that their employees are engaging and have the ability to track the impact their company and employees are having in the world and map that back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is the new worldwide framework for the most important issues that we need everybody working on together. And we do all of this through an incredible UI. But at its core, Philanthropy Cloud is a marketplace. It enables our ecosystem of nonprofits and schools to provide their content and engagement opportunities to that marketplace, giving opportunities, volunteering opportunities. And then individuals that work for 
companies like Gas South have the opportunity to engage. And Gas South has seen incredible results uh, in their work on Philanthropy Cloud so far. They have a measurable 5% boost in their company perception. They've increased their employee engagement in these kinds of programs from 37 to 53%. And they've seen an 18% increase in their employees' giving since they launched Philanthropy Cloud. Really incredible results. And the nonprofits, like our partners at United Way, have that ability to build those relationships, to get people engaged in the work of the community, and get the resources that they need to go execute on the programs and help us build uh, sustainable communities. And so if Salesforce CRM helps one organization manage their relationships with many individuals, Philanthropy Cloud is exactly the opposite. It helps one individual manage their relationship with many organizations, whether that's their relationship with their workplace, whether that's their relationship with the nonprofit that they're engaged in, or whether that's their relationship with their alma mater. And we also know that the organizations that are part of this marketplace often use Salesforce CRM, whether they're a company or a nonprofit or a school. And that's led to some really interesting challenges that we're gonna talk about today. The first big one for us is scalability. We need to be able to scale to tens of millions of users, millions of content items, millions of nonprofits, thousands of workplaces. Extraordinary scale. We also have an individual-centric tenancy model. And because we're building with the individual as the principal central actor in the marketplace, we can't use Salesforce CRM. But we also know that the organizations that are in the marketplace uh, have Salesforce CRM, and we need to provide integration with that. And in this multi-sided marketplace, that means we have to have organization-based roles and permissions inside of the marketplace. Because organizations might be a workplace like Gas South. They might be a nonprofit like United Way. They might be a content provider like GuideStar that are playing different roles in that marketplace. And so to tell you guys how we've solved those challenges, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our first architect on Philanthropy Cloud and our CTO for web and mobile, Mike McCormick. Thanks, Mike. Thank you and welcome. Uh, it's really exciting to see all these people here who want to geek out with me and get technical. Uh, I'm always grateful that there are people who are interested in the same arcane sorts of things I am. So before we start, could I get a show of hands? How many people here have deployed an app onto Heroku before? Great, that's a huge number. How many people have deployed multiple apps that need to communicate with each other onto Heroku? Okay, a smaller number, but still some. I'll, I'll be interested to hear how you guys do it uh, compared to how we decided to do this. So I wanna start out with uh, setting the scene. I was engineering hire number one. This was at the end of July in 2017. We'd signed a contract with the United Way. We had a whole bunch of business requirements. We had 10 months to build it. And uh, we knew that we were going to build on Salesforce. We knew what the model was that we wanted to do with the United Way. So I'm gonna walk through, Nick did a really good summary at a high level. I'm gonna start driving deeper and deeper and deeper into this to explain exactly how we did things. And by the time we're done, we'll have a lot of extra technical detail in place. So United Way specializes in, in this was our, our 10 month goal. We have a longer term goal that I'll also talk about at the end of this part here. But initially on day one, talking about the United Way, they specialize in engaging uh, employees of workplaces in giving through giving campaigns in the workplace. So in our model, we have workplaces and they have employees. Then we have service providers, in our case, nonprofits. They provide the nonprofit work. And then in between these, we have the local United Ways. These local United Ways take the nonprofit service offerings and they create these bundled service offerings through campaigns or through something that I call impact funds, which groups nonprofits based on cause or location or whatever they feel like is part of something that they would want to have within a campaign. And then through the workplace to the employees, providing a branded experience through that workplace to be exposed to all these opportunities. Underneath all of that, a recommendation engine, something that can take the employee profile, the employee actions in the system, 
match those to nonprofits or those service offerings to get people engaged in the things that they really care about, as Nick talked about. Now, it starts to get interesting here because there are over one and a half million nonprofits in the United States. There are different roles that people can play in the system. For example, workplace admins. These are employees who are also acting as administrators sometimes. Workplace partner ad admins. These are employees who are working on behalf of a local United Way, for example, in this example, to administer these workplaces. Uh, and then we have the one and a half million nonprofits. Uh, the United Way has partnerships with over 100,000 workplaces and through them reach to uh, 48 million or more employees. So this slide is almost incomprehensible at this point, uh, but it's gonna get more complicated. Uh, so let me take all that off and just use words at this point. After the United Way, the next thing that we need to do and we're in process of doing right now is imagine that this workplace is not only engaging with employees, but they're engaging with uh, customers. So maybe they, they wanna have their customers be philanthropic actors through the company. Uh, imagine the workplace is actually a university, and instead of employees or customers, we have alumni. Perhaps the workplace is not a university or a workplace, but it's some sort of affinity group like the NFL fans and the individuals interacting with it are part of that affinity group. Now imagine that all of these individuals can interact with all of these different entities all at the same time, depending on how they come into the system as administrators, as end users, affinity groups, universities, all of those things. Now also imagine that instead of just donating, they can do all sorts of other things like volunteering and uh, perhaps pursuing corporate social responsibility goals like sustainability, grant making, as, as Nick explained, all sorts of different things, uh, skills gap, skills training, financial services, health services, all of these sort of welfare goals. Imagine all of those are in the system as well. So what we have is a combinatorial explosion of problems to solve, uh, contexts, authorization systems. So when we build something like this, there are some key words that come to mind. There's horizontal, elastically scalable, reactive microservices platform. All of my favorite words. Oh, event-based, I forgot that one. So we wanna have this thing be able to scale elastically, horizontally, we wanna have asynchronous communication between all the systems. So we're talking about a microservices platform. So let's walk through and talk about all the pieces that need to be in place. Um, imagine throwing all the pieces of your puzzle on the table and you start to turn them over and you start to figure out the best way to group them, the most efficient way to think about them and start linking them together. That's what I'm gonna do here. Um, on the data side, we have a need for a relational database so we can do secure, high-performing transactional data systems. We need something for a data lake, some sort of large store for our offline analytics uh, logging, auditing, all of that kind of things, feeding our machine learning engine. We need a highly performant index search engine. We need a file system so we can serve up files uh, to clients uh, or store them internally. And then we need an in-memory cache for performance, something distributed and available to all of our microservices. The next level over, we have infrastructure. We have a bunch of data flowing, so we need pipelines. We need some way to actually manage deduping and cleaning up that data, making that data useful and meaningful. Uh, we need an event bus for our asynchronous communication between all of our services. We need a messaging system so we can send emails and SMS and push notifications. CDN so we can get our stuff out there onto the edge and be performant in reaching our clients. We need an identity management system. We need to do monitoring, logging, auditing, uh, routing. We need an image processing system, something where we can serve the right images to the right clients at the right size, at the right aspect ratio, at the right time, and upload images and have it process those for us. The next level is app infrastructure. This is where we start to wrap the infrastructure piece with app-specific needs. So a registry, some way to track all of the microservices that we have in place and how they do their things and what they do. A scheduler for repeating jobs 
an API gateway so we can control access into the system. We can say who gets to open this door and walk through. Uh, a notifications piece that can wrap the messaging so we can decide to whom we send notifications, all the business logic, what a business notification needs to look like. Content system, so we can ingest content, create content in the system, present content. Uh, we need something to wrap our search engines so we can do real-time text searching from our clients. Uh, we can optimize the way that searches are surfaced. Uh, we need machine learning where we can take in all the information flows. We can make recommendations of the right content to the right people at the right times. We need an authentication server, some way to actually manage the identities of all the people in our system. And then we need an authorization system, which Nick touched on, the very complex system we're building where multiple people, multiple kinds of organizations, all in different contexts, playing different roles at different times. Once you get people in the door with authentication, how do you decide which rooms they get to go in and which chairs they get to sit in? We had to focus a lot of our intellectual energy on writing something that hadn't been done before. And this kind of authorization in this multi, multi, multi-tenant system was something where we really had to focus a lot of effort. And then we have the application services themselves, being able to process payments, being able to manage donations, volunteering, onboard workplaces and their employees, brand the workplaces uh, in their websites and their apps, and then report, reporting volunteering history, donation history, any other kind of service that's being provided to the end user, to the organizations, to the intermediaries, those local United Ways, to the global United Way, all of that kind of thing through our reporting system. And then at the very top, our clients, our web app, our mobile app, and our partner APIs. So these are all the puzzle pieces, admittedly simplified. I've left a bunch of things out. Some categories can be argued. But essentially, these are the puzzle pieces. This is the way that we'll talk about them. So we want to focus on building the things that we care about. We need to hire an engineering team that is skilled in building the things we need to build. We don't want to, with only one engineer on day one, be spending time writing things that aren't specific to the platform that we are building. And so as you look to the left side of the slide, these are all the things we don't want to do. We want to find some sort of third party provider to help us do this work. So Heroku to the rescue. Talk really broadly about some Heroku concepts. Most of you are already going to know this, so I won't drill super deeply into this. Uh, but Heroku has this idea of an app, a bundled application logic that you can deploy in a cluster. It exposes an endpoint. It does things that you want. Think of it like a web server uh, in the old fashioned days. Uh, it, it sounds a lot like a microservice. And Heroku has this, you can have multiple kinds of apps, multiple apps running in Heroku. Heroku also provides this concept of a space, a uh, private space, which is like a home network. You have a virtual network. At your home network, all of your devices in your house can talk to each other, but there's a firewall blocking access from the outside world into your house, and there are rules about who can get in there. So this private space, think of the devices in your home as being microservices. Uh, this private space is a place where you can deploy all of your apps. They can talk to each other in a secure fashion, and anything that wants to get in there and talk to them has to go through a gateway. Heroku also has this concept of the add-on. An add-on is a managed service. It's just like a microservice you can think of, but it's actually prepackaged, prepped, and dynamically available to any of your Heroku apps. So an example would be the Postgres add-on. By using the Postgres add-on for our relational database, we didn't need to do anything when it comes to procuring hardware, managing updates, making sure that it's available at all times, scaling, sizing, uh, disaster recovery. All of these things are taken care of by the Postgres add-on. So when we're thinking about who we need to hire, we can say we don't need to hire someone who's a DB ops person. I know what a lot of you think uh, when you hear something like this. Someone's providing me something. That means that they're going to do things for me. And then when it comes time for me to want to do something for myself, they're not going to let me do it because I'm going to get in their way. And that's absolutely not the case in terms of the Heroku add-ons that we've used. We've been able to do everything we need to to tune the system to as high performance as possible. 
we can on our Postgres instance interface through the command line interface with Postgres exactly like you would with a native Postgres instance. So we can do all of our, our schema updates, all of our data seeding, all of those kinds of things uh, we can do. And so we're not blocked by the fact that this add-on is providing these services for us. So we can share these add-ons between all the different apps. And then we have a whole bunch of add-ons we can choose from. So when we go back to the service architecture, let's talk about how we start knocking these things out by going through the inventory of Heroku add-ons. Everything purple here is the stuff that we are able to cover. Like I mentioned, the Postgres one. We've got Redis. Redis, <laughs> an amazing in-memory cache. Uh, we have Kafka, which is the top of the you know, best of breed event system. We use Mailgun for our messaging. We have Fastly for our CDN. We have New Relic uh, for monitoring, Sumo for logging, and then Cloudinary for all of our image processing work. As you can see, we haven't knocked out everything. So what's the next way that we can get things out of the way that we don't have to manage in depth? The next level is third-party services. Uh, HBase for our offline data store, Elasticsearch for our high-performance search engine, S3 for our file storage, Spark for our pipelines. You're probably all thinking, hey, I know who can provide all these things, AWS. And wonderfully, uh, Heroku is perfect for connecting with AWS. We set up an AWS private subnet, and using a, a VPC, we're able to connect that subnet into our Heroku private space. And so we have secure communication straight into our, all of the AWS services that we need. So boom, all of those are taken care of. And then you'll notice a couple of other things, Salesforce Identity and Einstein, we need to interface with Salesforce. Wonderfully, Heroku has a whole bunch of great conveniences for that. We can use Heroku Connect, which synchronizes uh, Postgres data. We can use external objects. We can use a force.com API, or we can just use the REST API and OAuth to connect into the Salesforce system. So we use Salesforce Identity, and we can connect with Einstein as well. Now, the rest of these things are all things that we had to write custom. It's important to note that these things on the left still are things that are very thin. They're thin wrappers. They're almost API wrappers into the things that are being provided, like uh, the, a the API gateway. It really just is an interface to Salesforce identity. Um, notifications is just a wrapper around the mailgun piece. Um, so for the most part, the things on the left that are blue, we still didn't have to do a whole lot of work on. It only started to become work when we got to the authorization piece and the th other things to the right. And that's good, because these are all the things that are specific to our platform, and these are the things we want to hire people to work on. So what does this actually look like when you deploy it? Um, this is where the slides get complicated. Feel free to take out your camera, zoom in, uh, take a deep breath. Um, this, this, uh, I'll walk you through this slide. Um, it's simplified and complicated at the same time. So these two purple boxes, these are our private spaces. The one on the left is the externally accessible one. This has a public HTTP endpoint. And so the web browser, the web app, the mobile app, the partner APIs, the callbacks from Stripe, our payment processor, all those things come in through this public space. Into this public space, we deploy our user interface, our web app, um, and through the Fastly add-on, it gets pushed out into the CDN for availability to the browser. Um, we also have an API gateway. Another way that we saved a lot of time is by using open source. We use uh, the Netflix OSS system. We have Zool as our API gateway. And Zool's job is to, when a request comes in, do the authentication. So take whatever token, whatever credentials have come in, go to Salesforce Identity uh, through the APIs uh, that were provided through Heroku. We get out to Salesforce Identity. We can verify that this person is who they say they are, and they can have access. And then we go into the private space. The private space has all of our internal microservices running, all of the add-ons that go with them. This, of course, isn't the complete list of add-ons. So when Zool calls into the backspace, it talks to Eureka. That's the other shoe in the Netflix OSS pair here. 
Eureka is a service registry. This is how we manage having multiple apps in a space and having the apps figure out how to communicate with each other. So when they start up, they register with Eureka. Eureka gets their addresses, manages the routing. And then when a call comes in from the API gateway, we have an endpoint. We ask Eureka, where is this endpoint? We get it back, and then we forward the requests on. All of that also happens internally when one microservice needs to talk to another. We can go through that same Eureka process. As part of the endpoints in each of these microservices, we also have an authorization service. And that's where we spent, as I mentioned, a lot of our work trying to come up with a way to, once someone comes in the front door, control which things they can access. And so we home rolled an attribute-based access control system. We call it the perme permeable tendency authorization system. You can see at the top here uh, the picture of the AWS subnet and the VPC that we're connected with there. And we manage that uh, through a, a tooling host, uh, a jump host tooling host system. Uh, and you can see S3 on that piece as well. So how do we actually get things out to look like this? We use the Heroku CLI. Most of you have used the CLI. It's a really powerful tool that allows you not only to create an app, configure an app, deploy an app, uh, configure how the app is built, how it's deployed, you can actually create the spaces themselves with the CLI. You can control the, uh, all of the processes that are happening on your add-ons as well through the CLI, uh, like Postgres commands. You can clear your Redis cache with the CLI. There's nothing it can't do. Uh, so what we do with the CLI is we wrapped it with Ansible scripts. Uh, and that way, through the Ansible scripts, we orchestrate the deployment of all these pieces in order out into the spaces. So we create the apps, we configure the apps, we deploy the apps. And so I'll talk about that next. This is our deployment flow. We further wrap, just like Ansible wraps the CLI, we wrap Ansible with Jenkins scripts. So depending on what environment we're going into, there may be some special things that we do in terms of the order of how we run the Ansible scripts and how we configure things. And so we can use Jenkins to then impose that next level of logic. So we have Jenkins master running in AWS, kicking off Jenkins agent work that's actually orchestrating the Ansible calls. So stepping back a minute into this drawing here, we start on the very left side. We have two things in Git. We have the application source code, all of our microservices, all of the things that we have that have to do with our deployment code specifically for our platform. The next thing we have in Git is deployment metadata. This is metadata that determines exactly how something should be deployed to a given environment. Both of these things are stored in Git. There are two ways that we start a build. We can either have a merge trigger, so someone merges into the deploy system, uh, into the deploy branch, and it will trigger, it can trigger, depending on the environment, the whole pipeline of deployment. We can also have manual triggers, so if we have a scheduled deployment to production or something like that, this can be kicked off manually. So, uh, Jenkins kicks off, and we get to uh, the CLI pieces. So we have the Heroku app set up. This is, these are the CLI things that actually create the apps. The next thing, it's a little bit interesting, where we reached the point where we realized we needed to do something special during deployment around some of our add-ons, and these were data-specific. So when we're deploying, we might need to upgrade our, uh, our database somehow. We might need to migrate a schema. We might need to change some of the seed data or any data in the system. So all of the configuration of that data stuff we decided we would make a special app in Heroku that was nothing but a package of these scripts, and we would attach the add-on to that app. Other apps that wanted to use it could connect to it uh, as well through the configuration, but we would have one actual app that's managed and in charge of the add-on itself. So that's what uh, 12 and 13 here on the slide are. These are the processes for deploying, upgrading, and migrating data using the data-specific shared app during the deployment process. The next piece is the setting all the configuration variables. We stored in Git as part of the deployment metadata encrypted keys. 
Uh, so those get pulled in uh, in a secure way and then added to the configurations. Any other configuration specific items around the environment get applied to the apps. And then we kick off the actual deploy process. And at this point, Heroku uh, can grab things. It starts to uh, do all of the builds of all the microservices. And as most of you know, Heroku does a really nice job with rolling deploys. And so you can have your cluster of apps and you can start rolling new versions into that cluster. Uh, and you can have as little downtime as possible if you're doing things right on your side, which isn't always easy. And uh, we also have the same kind of process wrapping our, uh, our AWS interface. Um, so we don't use the Heroku CLI for that. We use our tooling host, and we have scripts in Ansible for that. So all of these things happen. We get everything pushed out. If everything goes well, we're, we're golden. The next question is, this is great how you do it remotely, but how do you do it locally? Imagine the earlier slide, but instead of having a Jenkins script, we just have a local script. Uh, Heroku has this concept of the Heroku local command, where you can actually start apps locally. You can add in some parameters, like what port you want something to run on. There are some tricks with certificates and things like that to make sure that that you have SSH supported on local environments and, and how those things work, uh, which we're not gonna have time to get into here. Uh, but you can, you can manage all of these things locally. All you need is a, an analog to that Jenkins orchestration that runs on the local machine instead. One challenge we had was with the add-ons. We didn't wanna be running Postgres. You can't run an add-on locally for one thing, but we wouldn't wanna run Postgres and Redis and Kafka and mirror all these things on a local machine. So what we did was we created a shared app remotely on Heroku, and we namespaced all of the add-ons, uh, all the data in the add-ons. And so all of our local environments, when we spin up apps, they can connect to the shared app in the Heroku space. And because your namespace protected, everyone can do whatever they want with their data in that shared app. And now the developer is free to do iterative development of the services on their machine off of feature branches or whatever they want. So, uh, and we have, again, the analog in the uh, AWS side as well. So here were some of the challenges we had uh, and the evolution that we're looking at next. And here's really where some of the things that when you're starting out or if you've already started out, it'll be interesting to hear the kind of things that you've been thinking of. Um, and some of these things we wish we'd done sooner. Uh, one thing that we've really seen an issue with is during our, our building from our local machines or even from uh, our tooling machines, our Jenkins boxes, sometimes the tooling environment is not predictable. Sometimes you end up building things in Heroku that build differently locally. You end up with weird build artifacts. Things aren't exactly predictable in every case. Uh, some developers, as you know, are going to be busy changing their shells, they're gonna be installing a different version of homebrew than you're expecting. All sorts of cruft can be left behind. And these can cause major headaches in the developer experience and trying to get these things out or in the DevOps experience, trying to get things into production or anywhere else. And so we're looking at uh, using Heroku slugs, pre-building the stuff and storing it in an artifactory and versioning it so then we can use those instead of having to build. It also saves us a lot of time to be able to do that. For the local deploy side, the analog of that is using Docker, um, having a pre-built Docker image with all the tooling built in so you can control for the tooling uh, can help a lot with maintaining a stable environment that you're working in. Uh, it introduces other complexities with how do these containers talk to each other and so we're looking at Docker, Docker Compose or Minikube, Minikube, however you want to say it, for orchestration. Um, we also have been suffering from long deploy times, the inability to share local builds with other developers for QA uh, or just feature branch testing, verification, pair programming, however you want to talk about it. Um, and also performance on the local machine running all of these apps. So the things that we're looking at doing is taking what we do with local, which is building things locally, having a shared environment for the things that are shared, and pushing that into an AWS instance so we can um, treat the remote AWS Linux box as if it were a local deployment environment 
and it has a public endpoints, at least within our VPN, so other developers can come in. So when you create a feature branch, you do a git push, we kick off a build, we use the artifactory so we can grab everything we need, we build this, we call it a pre-PR environment, we can run tests against it, and other developers or QA people can look at it and do all of their work against it, and then as soon as we're done, it just automatically gets torn down, so we're not paying fees to keep things around that aren't being used all the time. And then we're looking at hybridizing this. As I mentioned, having all the apps running on your local machine can be expensive, painful. And so we want to be able to run only the microservice that you care about. And we want to be able to transparently hook into a remote. So if we take that AWS remote environment and we have all of our apps there except for one that we're working on locally, then we can have quick spin up, we can do local debug, it's only the thing we care about, and then we have a remote environment that it's working against. So the top lessons learned, this is really a list of everything that I just said. These are the things that if you're just starting out, you should know, and things that we wish we would have done first. So the top lessons learned, and some of these we did do first, identify your managed services, find the Heroku add-ons, the AWS managed services, how you're gonna integrate with your third-party providers. Knock out all that stuff on the left that you can. Whatever's left, make sure that's the stuff you wanna own. Have an external space and an internal space. Use Zool and Eureka to connect those two or, two or something like that. Wrap your CLI with Ansible. Uh, use in your CI CD pipeline, Git. Have your apps and your deployment metadata as two separate things in there. Use Jenkins to orchestrate and use dedicated add-ons, add-on apps to manage your data during the deployment. And the things that we wish we would have done sooner, having slugs, having the artifactory, and using containers. So uh, I wanna thank you all for coming here. Uh, I wanna let everybody know, of course, uh, most important thing, we're hiring. If this is the kind of stuff you'd love to work on, please come to us and talk to us. Also, if you'd be interested in integrating with Philanthropy Cloud with your apps, we're building APIs right now. We'd love to hear the kind of things that you'd like to do. And also, if you'd like to see a demo of a product, uh, contact us as well. Um, we have a minute, 50 seconds for questions. Afterwards, feel free to grab me and we can talk privately as well. Does anyone have any questions? Why? Uh, when we started in August of 2017, you couldn't do Docker on Heroku. Um, it became beta probably about six months later. So it's what we wish we would have done first. Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Um, well, Heroku, as opposed to... The Heroku add-on infrastructure and the way that we could use spaces was, imagine Amazon's tooling system, but with all sorts of facilities to get going there faster. So Heroku has a whole bunch of extra things on top of AWS. In fact, it's literally built on AWS. It has a whole bunch of extra things in top, on top that it would manage for us. So we didn't need as many DevOps people as quickly in order to do the super tight hands-on that AWS would have required. It's a good question. Okay, all right. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And again, contact us if you want to talk about any of this stuff more. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.